We're live on Wednesday night for Wednesday night Bible study. I'm Pastor Price from Omega Ministries, and we're broadcasting here on live stream tonight, endeavoring to get into another Bible study and hopefully into an area of edification, exhortation, and comfort through God's Word in order to edify the body of Christ. All right, let's pray and we'll get going for tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for this time of sharing. Thank you for the word of God that is able to save our souls. Right now, we commit this time to you, God, to understand your word, walk in your word, be changed by your word into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, allowing us to have fellowship with you through him via the Holy Spirit. God, give direction, bring clarity, open our minds to understand your word. Bind the devil from the minds of people so they can hear. Bind the distractions of the devil. Bind the thoughts of the devil. Bind all of the inroads of the devil to our lives so we can actually concentrate and focus on the word of God alone in order to be made over into your image, allowing us to enjoy the benefits of salvation. And God will be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, first of all, let me take one swig of ginger beer. And we'll get going for tonight. Tonight we're talking about blood brothers. Blood brothers. What knits all of us together, both men and women alike, is the fact that we're blood brothers. We have been called out of the world We've all partaken of the blood of Jesus Christ to knit us together in a family unit and blood now unites us as the family of God. We are under the blood of Jesus Christ. The common denominator for church, the real church, the actualized church, is the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been born again by the blood of the Lamb and we overcome this word, world by his blood and the words of our testimony, what we say and what we confess that the blood has done for us. So that's what it's all about, being one, united together, under the blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ. We're all blood brothers. Let's take a look at it from the Bible. Genesis chapter 1. Make sure you have your Bible. Do not listen to anybody open up the Word of God and you not have your Bible because you have to verify, double check, triple check, make sure, pray over it. Don't let anybody make inroads into your mind without your Bible and without you following along with them. We invite all people to go to the Bible for themselves. To understand the engrafted word of God that is able to save your soul. Also, be, be aware of this. The Bible is revelatory. It is not something you read like you would a newspaper article or a magazine article. The Bible must be revealed by the Holy Ghost. If you've been born again, the next thing you need is to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You know, in Acts, the disciples came to a group of people and asked them had they received the Holy Ghost since they believed. They didn't ask them that they received the Holy Ghost when they believed. They asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And the response was, we didn't even know that there was a Holy Ghost. And they proceeded to lay hands on them, pray on, over them to receive the Holy Ghost. They received the Holy Ghost and began to talk in tongues and prophesy, etc., and magnify God. So you need the Holy Ghost to understand the Bible. You can be born again of the Spirit, but without the Holy Ghost, your mind will still be foggy and it, it will tend to not understand a lot of things about God. The Holy Ghost brings clarity, the Holy Ghost brings understanding, and the Holy Ghost brings the inner ability to verify truth. The Bible calls the Holy Ghost the spirit of truth. Do not go any further. Do not pass go. Do not collect the $10,000 or whatever it is on the Monopoly board. You need the Holy Ghost. I don't care what anybody tells you. I don't care how much they talk to you. I don't, I don't care how much they tell you you got it when you got saved because the, uh, the, the disciples asked the people, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? I challenge every one of you to go through the book of Acts and if you don't have the Holy Ghost, read the book of Acts and see all the different ways 
and all the different circumstances under which people receive the baptism in the mighty, powerful Holy Ghost. You have to get the Holy Ghost. You might have to seek God. You might have to pray. You might have to fast. You might have to get rid of some stuff that God wants you to divest yourself of so you will receive the Holy Ghost. Don't let anybody tell you that you don't need the Holy Ghost. If you know you don't have him, don't let anybody tell you that you already have the Holy Ghost. You need power to live the Christian life. The Bible plainly says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, enabling you to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Acts 1.8. So look, get the Holy Ghost so you can understand, ingest and digest the word of God and grow through and by the engrafted word that is able to save your soul. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 verse 26. The Bible says this, and God said, let us make man in our own image. So that word there, let us, 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 plurality. This is God talking. Who is he talking to? It's one member of the Godhead talking to the others because the Bible gives us the word there for God as Elohim. Anytime you get an I am on the end of a Hebrew word like seraphim or cherubim, Anytime you see that I am, it's the same as putting an S on the end of an English word. It indi indicates plurality. And God said, let us make man in our image. Look at all the plurality there now. After our likeness. And let them, so you see how it's plurality appended to man. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. And over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his, in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. In the image of God created he him. Now he breaks it down. Male and female created he them. So who is the him referring to? The him is, refer is referring to the spirit man. The image of God is found in your spirit. Your spirit is the image of God. God is a spirit, the Bible says. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So therefore, the spirit man is the him that is created in God's image. And you know once you are released from this human body, once you are released from this carnal existence, there is no gender to the spirit man. So God created him, the spirit, in his image, and then placed the spirit in a male or female body. So your spirit man, which is neuter in, in gender, has no gender, is placed into a male or female body, and then God tells us to govern our conduct based on the body we've been placed in. So you can't make a man and a woman the same thing because the sameness is found in the spirit, but the difference is found in the physical parameters of the person. Male or female, he says, created he them. You can't walk around trying to act like a man if you're a woman. You can't walk around trying to act like a woman if you're a man. He only gave two choices here, male or female, no transgender, no homosexual, no lesbian, no transvestite, no butch, no gay, male and female created he, them. That's God's work. Everything else outside of God's work is a perversion of God's work. God's work has been mutated. It has been mutilated. It has been perverted by outside forces headed up by that old boy that you and I are so used to. And his name is Satan. Satan perverts the handiwork of God. He tries to modify. He tries to metamorphosize. He tries to change it. So everything outside of male and female that God didn't create is not the standard for God.
In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them after he created them with the two genders intact, the blessing came. The blessing came on the male and female together. The image of God was found in the spirit. They were spirit beings housed in temporal tabernacles that were male and female. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now that word replenish is very significant. You can't replenish anything that had not been inhabited before. It wouldn't make sense to say replenish something that was empty from the beginning. So there might have been some type of beings down here. There might have been some kind of a life type down here. The earth may have been going through restoration. Remember it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, etc., etc. He said, let there be light. Now, it's not consistent with, with God's character to create a place that is void and full of darkness without form. So there may have been some chaotic, cataclysmic event down here on earth between Genesis uh, chapter 1 verse 1 and Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. The, the real terminology there when it talks about the earth without form and void is tohu bohu in the Hebrew. If we had an uh, English word that's similar to it, it would be something like helter-skelter or chaotic or just confused. So that's what you have there. It's like a chaotic, confused environment that's void and without form and in darkness. And God's first words to this, uh, this arena was, let there be light. <clears throat> there may have been the fall of the devil and rebellion somewhere between Genesis chapter 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2. Because it talks about in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, you know, if he created the heaven and the earth then it's a lot of stuff that could have gone on in heaven and the earth that we don't know about. Now, this is conjecture. Don't write it down as facts, but I'm just looking at this thing logically. There had to have been something going on here, I believe, because he goes on next, <clears throat> later on in uh, Genesis 1.28 and says to replenish, resupply, reestablish, redo, rework. Something is going on if you, if you use the word replenish. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. So you see, the first instructions were to partake and live off of agricultural produce that came from the earth, the fruits, the vegetables, the seed, uh, the seed bearing fruits, the nutrients that came through herbs and that type of thing. So, you know, in the New Testament, you can't confine people to being to being a vegetarian, but there is something to be said about the nutrients that come from the earth that are transferred to organically gr grown food because we are made of dirt and the trace elements found in dirt actually make up the human body. So the pattern is you plant a seed, grow, you grow a crop. The nutrients from the soil transfer through the water that you water the food with, the, the crops with, the nutrients are then transferred from the ground to the crop or the or the uh, harvest of the fruits and vegetables and her herbs and that type of thing. And you actually are transferring the things that make dirt rich and dirt healthy to a dirt body 
that's made up of the trace elements and the same elements that make up the dirt. So a, a lot of animals that eat grass and hay and those types of things can be more healthy than animals that live off slop like pigs. So you got to understand, it's a, it's a normal, logical reason for everything. You and I are made of dirt. The Bible says from dirt or dust you were formed and to dust you will return. So anything that is agricultural, anything grown from the ground, absorbs from the ground the nutrients that will make your body healthy because you're nothing but a pile of dirt. So you get health for dirt from the dirt. All right. And to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creeps upon the, ground, uh, upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for me, and, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So you see, man was created on the sixth day. So now you have man in God's image. But what's very significant is the fact that God addressed man and gave him a name. He gave man a name and he called his name Adam. Adam was the name given to man. Now you know later on the Bible breaks it down and tells us how he put Adam to sleep and actually formed up Eve from Adam's rib. That's found in Genesis chapter 2 uh, verse 19. And he talks about how he made Adam and, and made him a help meet Eve. And that's not a help mate. That's a help meet. I had a lady correct me one time, you know, yelling at me, you know, that you mean a help mate, don't you? No, lady, I'm talking about the Bible here. He says a help meet. Somebody suitable to help somebody. Not a help mate. The Bible doesn't say mate. The Bible says meet. Check it out, a help me. Somebody suitable to help him. So you see here in uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse uh, 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. And brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman or Isha. The word for woman there is Isha. Because she was taken out of man, and the word there is Ish. Woman, Isha, man, Ish. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. And shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now that's the first available representation of marriage. A man and his wife cleaving to each other and becoming one flesh. How do you cleave to your husband or wife? When you go and do your marriage vows, the night of your wedding, you consummate the marriage. How do you consummate the marriage? Through sexual intercourse, a virgin is supposed to have her husband penetrate her for the first time, rupture her hymen, and she bleeds over his sexual organs. She bleeds over the penis, and that blood covenant is cut. He actually cut the woman open. He ruptured her womb and the blood that flowed over his sexual organs cut a blood covenant. Now you know why fornication is so detrimental. 
You're cutting blood covenants with all these folks and you're scattering your soul until you almost lose your mind because you're scattering your soul to so many folks that your soul is fragmented. You can't fornicate with all these people and not go insane, not be disgraced, not be ashamed, not feel condemned, not just feel plain old cotton picking nasty because your soul is being scattered. When the blood spews over that man's sexual organ, he cuts a blood covenant in the throes of the sexual experience when you consummate your marriage, the man then releases seed into the woman when he ejaculates semen. This is not nasty. It's not something we should avoid. I don't want my kids hearing this. You don't need your kid being taught this in that such education class at school. You better let me teach them. Because there's nothing nasty. There's nothing filthy about sex between a man and a woman who are legitimately, legitimately married before the living God. As a matter of fact, God gave the sexual experience to man as a gift for the cutting of the covenant. And legally cut covenants produce life. This is why insemination seed released into a woman engenders life. So you know that a man's semen is what makes blood in you and me. Your daddy's semen is what made your blood in you. Semen has the genetic makeup to make your blood. So you see now, the man's blood in his semen is dispatched into the woman. The woman's blood, after the hymen is ruptured, spews over the sexual organ of the man and a blood covenant is cut. Now look at fornication. Just imagine fornication now. Your first time you had sex. That woman's soul programmed to believe this is my husband. The first man that penetrated you. You told your soul that that man was your husband. And your soul automatically reoriented, reoriented, into, reorientated itself. To receive that man as your husband. Think about what I'm saying. You thought you were just a little 13, 14, 16 year old girl going to enjoy sex. But your soul received that man, that first boy or whoever you laid around with as your husband. If you were molested by your brother. Your soul received your brother as your husband. If you were molested by your daddy, your soul received your daddy as your husband. First man that penetrated you, ruptured your hymen, and the blood spewed over that man's sexual organs, your soul was programming to receive this man as the one you are now cleaving to as this man's wife. This is why you hurt so bad when that no good dude you laid around with and lost your virginity to spat in your face and told you to go somewhere. Now imagine doing that over and over again. Now you're a little playgirl. Now you're a diva. Now you're a hot chick. Now you're on top of your game. You're tearing your soul to shreds. How does the devil consummate a marriage? He has the woman drink down the man's semen. And he has the man drink down the woman's blood through oral sex. Can't you see that oral sex is the devil's way of cleaving two people together to make sure you're under a covenant under his auspices and the devil is your father because you're performing a sexual act that is a perversion of God's natural order and you cleave together in a dysfunctional sexual union involved in oral sex or anal sex, whereby the semen is released in the anus, and there can be no blood covenant cut in the anus unless the anus is destroyed and ruptured to bleed. It ain't pretty, I know it. It ain't nice, I know it. But I'm trying to tell you why sexual perversion is the calling card of the devil's kingdom. He's trying to get illegal covenants cut between human beings so God's legal blood covenant 
that should be going forth through a consummation of the marriage wherein a virgin girl is joined to a virgin man for the first time, their souls will cleave together. They'll cleave together, become one flesh under a legal covenant before the living God and your mind will be in peace. You won't have to get married and then compare your husband to the other 575 guys you've had sex with. You won't have to get married and be remembering Jeannie May while you're in bed with your wife because you've had so many women as a player out there. A player. You're a player, all right. Your soul has been scattered to the pit of hell because you've cleaved to so many women illegally. Folk don't want to hear it. I'm going to proclaim it. It's destroying people. Young girls are giving up their virginity to no good, good for nothing, scumbag guys all over the place, not realizing you just ruptured yourself, handed your soul to some old drag that hates you, and now he's r riding over the sunset with your whole, your, your whole soul in tow because you gave yourself under a, a, an illegal God forsaken demonic covenant that was outside of the framework of God's design for marriage. It's not pretty. It's not cute. It's not nice. I can't use sanitized words to fix it up because if I did, you would not hear me. It would be too cutie pie and too nicey nice so you can hear it. The devil is orchestrating illegal blood covenants. It's all about the blood. The Bible says blood touches blood and folks break out with sickness, disease, infirmity, mental uh, uh, incapacitation where you go insane. You have crazy. You're a babbling brook. All because you engaged in illegal sexual activity. This is why salvation is not an option. Salvation is a necessity because he tells us what in the Bible. What does he tell all of us point blank range? We've said it since childhood. We recited it over and over again. Every time you were taught something in Sunday school, you were taught this. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He restored my soul. Restore means to repair. He's bringing it back again. He's refurbishing you. The damage done through the sexual liaisons we had in the world is being repaired by the living God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants you to get before him in praise and worship, prayer and fasting to allow him to come inside to restore your soul. It's all about the restoration of the soul. What knits us together? The blood of Jesus Christ as a mechanism to restore the soul will begin to refurbish us. We'll all have a light precious faith, walk in unity as one under the same blood covenant. And we'll have unity in the community for the first time in, our, time in our lives. Because the blood will make us begin to think normally again. When you see a person that's contrary, when you see a person causing debate and hypocrisy and variance, always argumentative and bitter, always wanting to make their points and try to point out flaws and argue with you all day, they need to be born again and have the blood sanctify them. The blood, excuse me, restore their souls. The blood, return them to normal again. The blood, restoring sanity to them again. He restoreth my soul. He restoreth my soul. Psalm 23, 3. A restoration of the soul. That's what this is all about. Jesus put it this way. In your patience, possess ye your souls. In your patience, possess your souls. You got to fight, you got to scratch, you got to claw to get your soul restored to normal again. It's all about restoration of the soul. We got to have ourselves returned back to normal 
and the damage done to us repaired by the blood of Jesus. Said that in Luke 21, 19, in your patience, possess ye your souls. Take possession of your soul. Sit in, the, in a place of dominion over your soul. The word of God is given to restore sanity. We don't know how abnormal we were in sin. Some of the stuff you were doing, look at how crazy it was. Why are you doing all that cursing? Or like they say in the South, all that cussing. Why are you doing all that cussing? What are you cussing for? Here you are, a baby doll, pretty as you can be, looking like a million dollars, dressed to kill, and cursing like a sailor. The F word. Calling folk the B word. Cursing folk out left and right. Looking like a million dollars. Looking like a China doll. And cursing like you cursing. Girl, if you don't stop all that cussing, you better. What are you doing cussing like that? I'll tell you why. Because it's a reflection of your mind. See, the word for profanity comes from the word profane. And the word profane means to make a temple dirty. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The reason why you cursing is because the inside of you is so nasty. And spewing out of your nasty mouth is the nasty words that reflect the nasty soul that the devil has contaminated with his nasty self. Your heart is full of nastiness, so you curse it. If you're not cursing out of your mouth, you're cursing in your mind. Why you got those curse words in your mind? Stop all that cursing in your mind. We hear you cursing in your mind. Stop it. See, when you got nasty stuff inside of you, it's going to bubble up somewhere. That's why you got to have your soul cleansed, your soul purged, your soul set in right standing before God. You want to get free. You want to get out of this mess. That's what you're looking for. You want to get free from it all. It's time to shake off this dead man's clothes and let God restore our souls to normal. The blood. Look at Leviticus chapter 17. We're blood brothers. We're talking about the subject tonight. Blood brothers. The blood is what ties us together. He says in Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that make an atonement for the soul. See, he was given a representative type in the Old Testament through blood sacrifices made with animals of what Jesus was going to do when he was sacrificed on a vertical altar. See, the cross is really a vertical altar. Remember, in the Old Testament, the altar was horizontal. It was man sacrificing to God for man. Man sacrificing to God for man using animals. But in the New Testament, when Jesus came, it's a vertical altar. Why? Because now you have God, Jesus Christ, sacrificing to God for man. God is sacrificing himself up to God the Father for man. So it changed from a horizontal altar, man sacrificing to God for man, to a vertical altar, God sacrificing to God for man. Blood, he says, the blood makes an atonement for the soul. So you see where soul the, see where the soul is the problem with man. The physical body is just a tool. Your spirit is dead, not communing with God when you're not saved. But your soul is where the rebellion is broken out. You became what the Bible calls soulish, sensual, fleshly. Your five senses operate and you become lust-filled. Your thoughts become perverted. You have appetites for that which is abnormal. All the perverse sexual activities, pornography, all the addictions to food and gambling and drugs and alcohol. Your soul is seeking for something. What is it looking for? It's looking for what has been taken away from it. A relationship with God. See, you and I were made to be worshipers. You must worship. You have no choice. We were made by God to worship. Body parts are designed to worship. 
hands that lift up, knees you bow down on, a head lifted up. Everything, your mouth is for worship. The Bible says we offer the bullets of our lips to God. Everything on you and in you is designed to worship. Your heart is at peace when you worship God. But when you worship something other than God, you get calamity, you get dysfunction, you get chaos, you get confusion, finally ending in insanity because you're worshiping something the devil gave as a surrogate to God. We got to get back to worshiping God in spirit and in truth. The Father is seeking those kinds of people. So you see now the blood makes an atonement for the soul. What's an atonement? Uh, Derek Pierce used to like to say, it, if you break it down to at one minute, you can understand it. It brings us back into unity with God. It makes us one with God again. We atone, we're atoned for by the blood of Jesus Christ to bring us back into covenant relationship with God. We become part of the family of God. Adam actually means God's blood, Adonai's blood. The word dam in Hebrew is blood. Adam really means red. He was a red man taken from the clay. But God cohabitated with Adam in his spirit. And then he was able to be interactive with them because Adam's soul was responding to, interactive with, and coordinated to be functionally in covenant with God. His soul was not foreign. His soul was reflective of God. His soul was actually adapted to God. It was programmed to identify and walk with God. This is why when Adam failed, when Jesus came around, the word of God walking in the cool of the garden, in the midst of the day, when he came around, Adam's soul had been reprogrammed and misprogrammed, as it were, to identify with Satan. So Jesus was foreign and Adam hid himself from it. The soul has to be reestablished, refurbished. What the Bible says in Psalm 23, 3, restored. So we can actually become interactive with God at the expense of our flesh. So that's why you fast. That's why you pray. That's why you read the word. That's why you fellowship with people of a like precious faith. You're doing what is necessary to restore and recondition and reestablish that relationship with Jesus Christ so that you can relate to the Father again and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are no longer foreign to you. For that to happen, the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ is necessary. The blood of Jesus Christ will regenerate. He will repair the damage done to us through and by the blood. The Bible is the hyssop that splatters the blood on your soul. When you're reading the Bible, you're really taking a blood bath. You're bathing in the soul of Jesus. You've got to have the blood pouring over you and washing you, regenerating you, reestablishing you, making you more adaptive to God and more obedient to God than you are to your own flesh the world, and the devil. Blood brothers, everybody seeking the same thing, to be made over again into the image of God, the same image that Adam lost. Blood brothers, looking to resurrect the spirit in each one of us and then have the soul conform to the resurrected, born-again spirit at the expense of the flesh. If any man come after me, Jesus said, you must first deny yourself, then take up your cross, to crucify the old Adamic race in you so you can have covenant relationship with me and my father. He said, when you are reconditioned, when you're reformatted, I and my father will come and make our abode in you. We'll live in you. You'll become our resting place. You'll become our tabernacle. You will become our home. Jesus Christ by the spirit is for your body, and the Bible says your body is for the Lord. The soul must be regenerated. It must be reconditioned, reformatted. Psalm 23.3 calls it restored. Remember, 
Your spirit, man, is born again when the Holy Ghost brings it back alive when you accept Jesus as your Savior. Immediately, you are justified. You are justified by your accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. What does justified mean? Just You're made just as if you've never sinned. You've been born again. That born again experience has happened to you. Look at John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. We must be born of the Spirit to resurrect our spirits out from the dead. He's actually bringing us out from that dead carnal existence and bringing our spirits back alive again so that we become a reflective person that reflects the very nature of Adam before he failed. Your spirit, man, is regenerated, brought back to life again. You've been born again. Look at it in John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a, name, a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. A ruler of the Jews, the same, came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. Except a man be born all over again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. You've got to be born again. You've got so many folk running around talking about they're Christians. They go to church every Sunday. They sing in the choir. They're ushering. They're deacons. They're even preachers but they've never been born again. So they go through all the histrionics and gymnastics of what they call and interpret as Christianity, but they have never been born again. The Spirit of God never brought their spirits back to life. So you got a dead spirit running around trying to act like, look like, and appear to be a Christian. You know how frustrating that is when you're doing that? When you're trying to act like and look like something that you're not, the Bible calls you a hypocrite. A hypocrite, a play actor. You read the Bible, you hang around other saved people, and you try to act like them. And you know you're not born again. You know you don't know God. Why don't you stop? You know good and well you don't know God, and you're trying to act like you know God, but it's all foreign to you. God is foreign to you. He's strange to you. But you're trying to act like the other people, say what they say, trying to act like you got the Holy Ghost, talking in some made up tongues that you made up, you know, just saying what you hear other people say and trying to mimic it. And you know there's no fire in you. There's no power ebbing through you. The Bible is not even in any way, shape, form or fashion revealed to you. But you're trying to act like you're saved, having never been regenerated. Your spirit, man, has never been resurrected. Stop fooling around and come to God right and throw yourself on the altar and tell him, God, I want to be born again. All of the religious stuff you do is frustrating when you haven't been born again. You're doing all this stuff, but you've never been born again. Don't you know how frustrating that is? To keep trying to look like and act like and be a part of and say the right stuff and try to look like you belong and trying to see what everybody else is doing so you'll do the right thing and say the right thing and you're coming up with all these crazy interpretations of the Bible. It really makes you mad when anybody really preaches the real gospel because you haven't been born again. So all you can do is sit there and pick it apart and trying to sow discord and confusion and you're analyzing everybody else. Anytime you see somebody always analyzing somebody else, they need to be born again. Because, see, this thing will make you begin to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. This thing will make you begin to look at yourself and get the inward look. The Bible says to remove the beam out of our own eyes before we examine the little small specks in other folks' eyes. This thing is an inner journey. You must conquer inner space before you conquer outer space. You've got to have your soul restored. That process is called sanctification. So the first operation of the Holy Ghost is being born again for justification. After that, he begins the process of restoration of the soul, and that's called sanctification. Separating your soul unto the Holy Ghost. 
Jesus told Peter, after you're converted, heal your brethren. You need conversion after salvation. Your soul has to be reordered and reconditioned and reformatted. What he says and calls it in, in Psalm 23, 3, it's restored. You can buy an old house. That's justification. When Jesus bought you and you received him as your savior, you bought the old house. But before you move into that old house, that old hood house, you've got to restore it. You've got to renovate it. You've got to refurbish it so you'll, you can live in it. That's what we're going through now as saints of God. You've been born again, but you've got to be refurbished in order to walk with Jesus and, and be compatible with him. You've got to be reprogrammed. How can you have your soul scattered to all 30 of those sexual partners you had with a scattered, fragmented mind and soul, and now you try to relate to Jesus? Jesus' mind is not fragmented and scattered and crazy. So your mind has to be brought back in and restored. Your emotions have to be restored. Your feelings have to be restored. Your will has to be restored. Everything about you has to be restored. Your sexual appetites have to be restored. You have to be normalized because you've been driven insane by the world and your soul is scattered. Your mind has buckled under the stuff out there and you're just hanging on to sanity by a thread. Why do you think you had suicidal thoughts? Why do you think you're drinking the liquor and smoking the dope and shooting up the heroin? Why do you think you're escaping the music and entertainment? Why are you looking at the porno? Why are you masturbating? Why, are your mind, why is your mind just inundated with all these perverse thoughts? Your mind has been torn apart limb from limb. When you had a sexual connection and a liaison with somebody, you didn't just sleep with them. You slept with all the souls that were stored in them. And you take it, took in all these foreign elements, all these foreign souls, all these demons that cohabitated and had a covenant cut with these souls. And your mind took the full impact and all the blows of having your mind scattered through sexual unions. The more partners you had, the more your soul was scattered. A man shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. How many people have you become one flesh with? How many people have you become one flesh with? You've got to repent and beg God to restore your soul. He restoreth my soul. It's blood. According to Leviticus 17 11, that restores the soul. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Blood is the redemptive power for the soul. The blood of Jesus Christ comes to you and through you through the Word of God. The blood is flowing over you as you pray, as you fast, as you seek God. The blood flows over you when you worship. You really want a blood bath? Become a vessel of worship. Worship God all the time. And buddy, you'll get a blood bath. It'll recondition your mind. Your mind will begin to change. Your emotions will begin to change. Jesus will become highly significant in your life until he becomes the only thing that matters. And every relationship will flow out of that covenant you cut with Jesus. Jesus is the focal point for sanity. You want your sanity back? Focus on Jesus. You want to get rid of that Jezebel spirit that's got you bound and you don't even know it? Focus on Jesus. You want to get rid of that Ahab spirit? What I call the Ahabian race? Focus on Jesus. You want to get rid of lust? Perversion? You want to stop being a whore? Focus on Jesus. You want to stop being a homosexual, a lesbian, a transgendered person? Focus on Jesus. Bathe in the blood. It's the blood that's the power. The old song in church, there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and we love not our lives unto death. It's the blood, I'm telling you. The thing that is most ostracized and most condemned and left out of church is the blood. Folk don't like to talk about the blood, and the blood is the remedy. Why do you think people get so confused? 
I mean, we make things relatively simple here at Omega Ministries and folk just confused and become all chaotic in their thinking and can't understand what I just said or it's just so hard to see it. You need to be born again and you got to ask and beg God to restore your soul. Can't you see when you talk to people how weird they are? Can't you see what they really believe and how strange it is? Boy, it's hard when you're trying to play Christianity, play Christian, trying to look like a saint. Some are trying to say, thus saith the Lord, like you just talked to the Lord this morning. And everything you say after that is crazy. Stop. Stop kidding yourself. You don't become abnormal and strange when you really get born again. You become one of those most simple, uh, nice, easily understood people. And you just walk in it day to day. You don't have to become all deep and crazy. Some folks can't do anything. Without trying to look deep. I mean, every, you, you go bowling with them. And they're trying to tell you how the bowling ball is a, is a form of paganism. See, that ball with the three holes in it represents Molech, the god of the Assyrians. Look, man, listen. Stop. Some folk just crazy. You play Monopoly with them. They're trying to tell you how, how, the, how the dice are a, a form of paganism. And you can't you, backgammon. Well, let's just play a game of backgammon. No, when we roll the dice playing backgammon, this is really casting lots and calling up demons. You can't, man, you can't, you can't get around a carnal mind. A religious carnal mind is so chaotic, it will make anything complicated. It will complicate a white sheet of, sheet of bond paper. You show, show them a white sheet of bond paper, and they'll be looking for black spots on it. Or look at some area on it that's a little lighter than some other area. Complicated. Your mind is complicated. Twist. Everything is crazy. You've seen people do it. They just sit around and try to find something wrong with everything. And everything you do is something about it that's paganistic. Or it's of the devil. You go into hell. And look. All of y'all like that over there. All the normal folks over here. Now let's go on down the road as with the normal folks. Because when you're trying, you can't see anything. You'd be one of those people that accused Jesus of eating with publicans and sinners and calling him a wine bibber. Think about what I'm saying. Jesus is sitting over there with the sinners and all the dirty folk drinking a glass of wine. And you got a religious person over there with their hands folded saying, look at that. Look at that dirty dog. Talking about he's a teacher, a rabbi. He's supposed to be the Messiah. And over there with those dirty, stinking sinners drinking a glass of wine. And, I mean, I'm telling you, what a Moscata. Look at it. Look at it. You following him? That's how you'll get. You'll become self righteous when you got dirty blood. When your soul is nasty and you're trying to overcompensate for a nasty soul by becoming self-righteous, you're just religious. You're not going anywhere in Christ because you're not in Christ. You're in yourself and you just stamped yourself approved and you become self-righteous. You become like a tax examiner. You're always examining somebody else, but you never can get right yourself. Look, folks. Get in the word of God for yourself. Get in the word of God for yourself. Let it wash you. Let him regenerate you. Let him restore your soul. Get rid of the scatterbrained existence you've been walking in. Stop trying to act like you say. Stop trying to look holy. Stop trying to say all the right quips and quotes. And let God really refabricate you. Let him make you over. So you can walk around in the normalcy that is Christianity. The Bible says, the apostle writing, he says, look, I marvel that you're so soon removed from the simplicity that is in Christ. So there was a, name, a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night, this is John chapter 3, and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, but no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with you. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, 
except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You got to be born again to see the kingdom. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into the enter in the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So he's talking about water baptism and the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. Born of the water and the Spirit. Born of the Word and the Spirit. See, water baptism is a sign of repentance. But you can't get to repentance without the Word. The Word of God is the water. The baptism in water is drowning in the water. So you come back up saying, I'm a new creation. I'm a new creature in Christ. It's an outward expression of an inner thing. Born of water in the spirit. You can't enter in. You can't even get in. So you got to repent, turn, be baptized, receive the Holy Ghost, and let the Holy Ghost begin the regeneration process, the restoration process. The process we call sanctification under holiness. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is born of your mamas and daddy, daddy seed and egg come together, that's flesh. But that which is born of the Holy Spirit is spirit. I told you he's restoring the spirit. The born again spirit is the regenerated spirit. I told you he's coming from the inside out. He's going to rebirth your spirit and begin to redeem you from the inside out. He, the next process is the restoration of the soul. When the Holy Spirit brings your spirit man back alive, when you receive Jesus as your Savior, your spirit is perfected. Now, God begins to deal with the imperfect soul. The misprogrammed soul. The fleshly carnal soul. That's why he says in James, the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Don't let that man think he'll receive anything from the Lord. What's a double mind? Romans chapter 8 tells us what it is. You can have a carnal mind. To be carnally minded is dead, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So a double-minded man, according to James and Romans married together, must be a carnal and a fleshly mind in the same vessel with a spiritual mind, and you're flashing back and forth between the two. You got the carnal flesh in the mind vying for your affections, trying to get you to obey it, and the spiritual mind in your spirit saying, obey God, don't go over there, stop fornicating, leave all this trash alone, and let God renovate you. But see, a double-minded man is wavering between both worlds, and the Bible says in James, don't let that man believe or think he'll receive anything from the Lord. So my mission in life is to deaden the old Adamic nature, the fallen nature of Adam, the nature that the Satan rules, deaden that flesh and the carnality in my mind so my soul will be reconditioned and reprogrammed to obey God in my spirit and I can walk with Jesus Christ on a daily basis obedient to him because the tension is no longer in my soul. Man, this makes perfect sense to me. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, wherever it wants to, and you hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it came from and whether it, where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. Everyone that is born of the spirit. Carried about, the Bible is referring to here is, not only being born as far as regeneration, but carried about by the Spirit. He moves you around. He blows you around wherever the wind listed. That's where he blows you. And nobody can understand you. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Just like all these preachers in the pulpits don't know the first thing about God, trying to preach to you about God. Ginger beer break. Trying to tell you all about God and never met God. Never been born again. Never been sanctified. Soul messed up. Sleeping with every woman in the church. Homosexual, sodomizing folk in the church. Never regenerated. Never restored. Never sanctified. Never brought into holiness. 
and yet trying to tell you about God and spinning the microphone preaching to you. Get as far away from that trash as you can. You will know them by their fruit. You're a master of Israel and you don't know these things. Verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen. And you receive not our witness. Our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that comes down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the servant, serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him, not on him, in him. This is progressive believing into Jesus. Out of court, inner court, holy of holies. Faith is a progressive moving from the outside realms of God into the holy of holies as you come through the inner court. The inner court is the soul. You come from the outside through your soul into your own spirit. What's moving? Your consciousness. Your conscious mind. You're becoming conscious of God, his will, his ways, his appetites are taking you over. You don't have to sin because you don't desire to sin as your mind makes the journey from the outside of you being governed by your senses to the inside of you governed by the spirit of God. This makes perfect sense. The spiritual mind is the mind that has taken the journey from the outer courts governed by your five carnal senses what you see, hear, taste, touch, and smell, you've gone through the process of sanctification unto holiness, and now you're governed by the Holy Spirit in your spirit, and from the realm of dominion with the Holy Spirit in your spirit, you take authority over your senses, you take authority over your body, and you tell it what to do. This is why David told his soul, Why so downcast, O my soul, you will put your trust in God. you got to talk to yourself. I don't care how crazy you look in traffic if they watch you moving your mouth talking to yourself in your car by yourself. you got to learn to talk to yourself. you got to talk yourself out of some stuff and into others. you got to talk, man. you got to use your mouth and you got to talk to yourself. You got to take this Bible and preach yourself into your own personal coma until you're dead to the flesh and alive to the word and the world of God. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believing in him should not perish but have eternal, everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, that's the whole world electionist and he, and those that believe in all that Calvinistic stuff. He sent his son into the world to save the world through him. He said that the world might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he have not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Why do people love the darkness rather than the light? It's very simple. Every argumentative person, every debater, every person trying to confront you and be contemptuous towards you and try to always bring some railing accusation against you is because they love the world and they're doing evil deeds. That's Bible 101. They love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They're doing some dirt. So they don't like the light. They don't like you. They don't like Christ in you because I'm doing some nasty dirt. I'm religious. I go to church, but I go, with, I go to church with other dirty folk doing the same dirt I'm doing. Don't you come in here talking about holiness, sanctification, and honor and dignity because we don't plan to ever live that out. For everyone that doeth evil hate the light, hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved or exposed. Everyone that doeth evil hates the light, neither will they come to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved 
exposed. You hand them a CD and they hate you because it exposes me. When you are truly repentant and you want to stop sinning, you will come to the light. You will come to the light to be made free. You will acknowledge your sin and you'll seek out liberty. He that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought or worked in God. So you see, a born again person. Let's review here. Regenerated spirit. Spirit man comes alive. You, de you desire immediately the sincere milk of the word. You want to drink the word, man. Get me some word fast. I got to have it because I've been regenerated. The regeneration process leads to the word going into you and beginning to refabricate, reorder, restore the soul according to Psalm 23.3. He's actually taking your soul that's been facing the world, engaged in your five carnal senses, and he begins to convert your soul. What's he doing? He's taking your soul and turning it away from the world and turning it to God. But where is God? He's in your spirit. He's turning your soul away from the world to your own spirit where the spirit of God is abiding. And he'll lead you by a still small voice in your spirit. As your soul dies and quiets down as an air of resistance to God, you'll begin to understand and know things. He'll begin to talk to you and show you things. How do you think I know this stuff? You got to get along with God and you got to sit quietly. Prayer is not all talk, 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 talk. Prayer is listening for the answers and listening to God. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff I prayed about I got no answer for. I would like to go out of here right now and be in Bangladesh casting out devils. And I'm always asking, hey, look, just let me go. Why can't we just go? Let's just go. But of course, it's all contingent upon the cleaning and restoration of the soul. Delays are not on God's part. He's waiting for us to be totally purged. Eradicate all the filth and gutter rot. Get the mind reconditioned so the fruit of the Spirit will begin to spring up out of us. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, and faith will spring alive in us. So we can walk in the Spirit and He can trust us with the nine gifts of the Spirit. Nine fruit, nine gifts because we're trustworthy. We won't be self-righteous. We won't be uh, self-exalting. We won't be condemning the people. We won't be putting folk down. We won't be using the power of God to make us stars and make us famous. We won't try to use the power to get a lot of money. We won't try to use it to sleep with a lot of women or a lot of men. We won't be hanging around trying to look like, act like, be like, because we'll be dead. Dead to the flesh, dead to this world, having no pony in the race down here. I'm here to do a job with, to allow God to work through me. That's it. I want nothing back from anyone. I'm not looking to be liked. I don't need self-gratification. I don't need anybody's accolades. We're all here as blood brothers. Born again under the blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ. The blood has washed all of us clean. And we're walking in the spirit. Not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. We've been made into one unit under God. We are the family of God. And the blood of Jesus Christ has yoked us all together. So if you're in church fornicating, you're committing incest. That's your sister. That's your brother. And you got the audacity to commit incest in the body of Christ. Don't you know that lust is a foreign spirit? If you lust after a woman or a man, the Bible says if you look on a woman to lust after her in your heart, you've already committed adultery. So what does the world do? The women solicit lust. Think about this now. God has already said if you look on a woman to lust after in your heart, you commit adultery as a man. So what's happening? They, so the devil has given them the, 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 the nod to go and solicit lust. So we dress seductively. We wear stockings as our pants. Here you are, got some stretched leggings on as your pants. Why don't you put a a sweater over this. Why don't you wear a long shirt that's coming you up? No. 
I want you to see every crease and crevice and every outline of my body. See, when you put on that kind of stuff, all you got on is a second skin. And you are soliciting lust. You are looking for what the Bible calls in, in Proverbs, the unstable soul full of lust. You are pathetic as a woman. If all you can do is solicit lust, you are pathetic. Because all you're going to find is a weak knee, two bit, good for nothing, plucked up by the roots, sissified, little sissified man that's sitting there full of lust that you can dominate using body parts. And you're going to end up 40 or 50 years old by yourself looking crazy with nobody wanting you with your soul torn limb from limb. That's why you got so many folk ending up nothing but barren wombs. Or a lot of babies scattered from hither, there, and yonder with no husbands. And the world looks like a living hell because folks stayed in the flesh and they followed the dictates of their five carnal senses. The women solicited lust and the, women get, and the men gave in to the solicitation. We don't have marriages. We got prostitution. You got your man through lust and he was a lust-filled drag that, that you married. And you just married a prostitute, man, and you still paying for it. Can't you see every time that things don't go right, that the sex goes away, the sex drives up? That tells you, buddy, whether you know it or not, you're paying for it. You didn't buy the new shoes. Well, I guess you're sleeping on the couch tonight. What are you, a prostitute? You a, you a, you a married woman and behaving like a prostitute. You're using sexual prowess and power to control your environment and you reward little Tommy over there with a little sex if he bought you the ring you wanted. You are a prostitute. Where did it come from? The world, the flesh, the carnal mind, program to be a prostitute, a hooker. And you're still married with three kids back in the back bedroom. And you're a married prostitute still using the same old sexual stuff you used in the world to attempt to control your husband. He listened to balls on the on Omega website, woke up out of that coma, realized what you were doing, and now you're mad because you've been found out. And you listen to this message and say, I don't like that guy. Yeah, I know you don't because he's exposing your dastardly deeds. He said, Whatever's done in the light, in the darkness, the Bible says in John 3.20, reprove them, expose them. So I'm exposing you for being a hooker, married to that man, using your body to get what you want because you know he's weak for sex. One thing I know about Billy, you whip some sex on him, he ain't going to be no good because I'm going to take everything you got throwing that sex on him. You need to be ashamed of yourself. So what does the blood of Jesus do? It yokes us together in one covenant, a common unity. A community is a common unity. The blood. We are blood brothers. Our spirits have been born again. Our souls are being washed by the blood. So you go through justification when your spirit is redeemed and you get born again. You're being sanctified by the blood of Jesus as he takes you through a process of denying yourself, dying to this world. You might have to lose a few things to die to the world. Now, you might have to lose a house. You might have to lose a car. You might have to lose some friends. You might have to lose a little stuff that you thought was important, material material possessions. Folks not speaking to you now. You tried to worship your marriage and worship your husband and wife. So now they got to be foreign to you for a while because you worship them and place them above God. So now you're being shown how much you had put somebody else above God and you have they're acting funny and not speaking to you. So you get over them and then God can save them and you get back together again in right standing because you didn't place them above God. Sometimes your kids got to be foreign to you because you worship your kids. You worship them. You were going to live a vicarious life through them. What I didn't do, I want to see my daughter accomplish. I want to see my son become a top-notch recruit. You know, today was National Signing Day for the high school athletes. That they went all these, they signed up for all these colleges, and that's my boy right there, old Bobby, top linebacker in the state. I'm living a vicarious life through Bobby because I wanted to play football, but I hurt my leg in the tenth grade. 
but now I'm going to see my son become the, the next Herschel Walker. Look, man, you worship your kids. And God says you'll have no other God before him. He will make things go south on you because you worship them. So if you die to self, die to this world and stop worshiping things around you, the sooner you do that, the better so you can begin to live in peace because God has dealt with all the idols in your soul that came as your soul was scattered. As you lost relationship with God, you got to worship. So you made Beyonce your God or goddess. Jay-Z became your God. Lil, Lil Wayne is even your God. Oprah is your goddess. You got to find somebody to worship. You got to find somebody to identify with as a surrogate when you refuse to identify with God through Jesus Christ. You are going to find an idol to worship because we were made and designed to worship. But when we all come out of this thing, justification is done to the spirit man, just as if you've never sinned. Now, sanctification is taking place in the soul. Converting you, turning your, your soul, sanctifying you, turning your soul away from your senses that govern you to your spirit where you'll find the Holy Ghost governing you. The final process is glorification. This is when the physical body is glorified. Justification, sanctification, leading to final departure from this planet and glorification and the whole ball of wax Spirit, soul, and body have been redeemed. Spirit justified. Soul sanctified. Body glorified. Good buddy, I'm in home in heaven and I'm living and marching around the throne in glory, shouting and yelling because I went through the process to save me from this wicked, perverse, untaught world. Man, justification, sanctification, glorification, you can speed it up if you begin to seek the Lord. If your eye becomes single, your whole body will be full of light. If you'll fast and pray and press in, press in to have that sanctification process complete, headed toward glorification. What happens to us all as we come together in unity in the community is we have a light, precious faith, faith a common bond under the blood of Jesus. The blood-stained banner is, is making us one. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll wrap it up right here. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So you see now, one Christ, one God, one Father, everything is one. Why do you have so much diversity? Why do you have denominations? Why do you have people who claim to be Christians that can't get along? It's because their souls have been programmed differently by Satan and their idolaters. They have places in the soul that they've exalted above the Lord Jesus Christ. And it causes divisions. It causes, excuse me, disunity. It causes all kinds of dysfunctionalities in the body of, the, of Christ because diverse spirits governing diverse idols has disrupted the unity. This is why you get works of the flesh in the Bible in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 talking about all the works of the flesh, variants, emulations, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders. All these things are taking place because the soul is not being converted. You're still engaged in your five carnal senses calling yourself a Christian. Soul is still scattered. You got favorite preachers. You got favorite folks. You got all this stuff that's becoming an idol to you if you just sanctify yourself a fast. Sanctify yourself a time in prayer. 
sanctify your study of the word so you de dedicate your time to God and let him convert the soul so you can become a part of the blood-bought brotherhood. We're blood brothers. One blood. The blood of Jesus has knit us together in the bond of peace, the Bible says. Knit together in the bond of peace. Think about that. Nobody arguing, no debating. The bond of peace, he says. The vocation that we've been called to. Forbearing one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians 4, 3. The blood can do this. It will just allow this blood to convert the soul. Turn us away from the five senses toward the spirit. And let the spirit man come alive totally permeating your soul with the presence of Almighty God that you restore the image of God to your spirit, your soul, and finally your body when it's glorified. Blood brothers, blood bought, blood taught, the blood is the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. The blood makes atonement for the soul. Come on, man. Come on, woman. Stop fighting everything and let the blood wash you clean. He's here to restore you and me to normalcy. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood of the Lamb. Father, we thank you for this time of sharing. Thank you for the word of God. Sanctify us through your truth. Your word is truth. Turn us away from this world. Cleanse our souls from double-mindedness and all the filth that the scattered mind has appended to us. Fragmented souls through illegal covenant cut, covenants cut, blood covenants cut, through sexual filth that we performed, the sexual stuff we did, ignorantly not knowing what we were doing to ourselves. The Bible says he that commits fornication lacks wisdom because you sin against your own body. We didn't know. But now we know. We repent. We throw ourselves on the altar for, for the power of grace and mercy to take over. Have mercy on our souls and restore them according to your promise. Psalm 23, 3. You restore the soul. You restore the soul. Isaiah 53 says you poured out your soul unto death. A poured out soul to restore my soul. Do it, Jesus. Do it because you can. Do it because it's your will. Do it because we don't just ask you to. We beg you to. Restore our minds to some way be reflective of your mind. That we can think like you, walk like you, talk like you, behave like you. Have the emotions you have and interact with each other, each other like you do. And like you would. Lord. It's time, it's time to see a restoration of the body of Christ where we're permeated with the Spirit of God. Let the blood be placed on the lentils of our doorposts so the death angel will pass over us. Is the blood. I depend on the blood to restore my soul to normal. We were all heathens. We were all crazy, insane. But the blood is the blood of Jesus. The blood. Do it, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That's going to wrap it up for this week. Thanks, everybody, for listening in. You know, prayer is coming in three minutes. The number there is 1 805 399 1000. Access code 409 367. Again, 1 805 399 1000. Access code 409 367. Also, remember, we're still pushing forward on the building fund, pressing over $5,000 now, trying to get this money together for the building fund that we can move out into a permanent location to actually do what we do 24-7, along with the other ministers that we have in tow, a lot of teachers, a lot of different ministers that we're going to put out there by way of video presentations to help forge up and form up the body of Christ. You want to contribute to the building fund, you can find the address on the bottom of my website. 
www.omegaministries.org mail in contributions to that P.O. box. It's a separate P.O. box that's governed by the guys that run that in the ministry. People assigned to handle the building fund. I don't deal with that over there. That's why the separate post office box is given. Anything you designate that you send to the ministry, that saying building fund on it, we transfer it over there to those guys that are running that. But if you want to contribute to Omega, as you usually do, a lot of people have been very faithful helping. That post office box is 960146 Riverdale, Georgia, 30296. And like I said, on the bottom of the www.omegaministries.org website, the bottom of the page, you'll find the building fund post office box that you can send money directly to or contribute over the support button at www.omegaministries.org and just designate in your comments building from it. Aren't you ready to get out of here? Aren't you ready for this thing to go away? The faster we, can, we see our souls converted, the faster we'll see this world move on and we can go to glory and be glorified in glorified bodies and not feel the stress of having to be in a flesh and blood body. See, it's duress and stress on you when you're in a flesh and blood body because your spirit man is being, you know, edified, is expanding its borders, it wants to go home, but it's still held down by this flesh and blood body, and it becomes almost frustrating for your spirit man that's been regenerated to live in this flesh and blood existence. That's why the soul has to be converted to bring you peace inside and walk as a spiritual person even while in this body. It's all supernaturally done. So one minute away, prayer on in one minute. Again, 1-805-399-1000, access code 409-367. And we appreciate y'all, love everybody. We try to tell it straight as we can. It's all about teaching folk so they can get out of here and go, and go live with Jesus in peace. There's nothing down here. If you have hope in this world only, you're miserable. You're looking for eternal life that comes after this life in God's kingdom. Seek him. Obey him, love him, is the blood that makes us brothers. See you back here next week, 7.30 p.m. Wednesday night and 1.30 p.m. on live stream for the Sunday broadcast. Have a good night. Thanks for joining. Praise the Lord.